before I, uh, oh, there we go. Uh, before I jump into my, to, to my uh, start, it would be great if all of our GitLab team members would want to hop off the mic real quick and just introduce themselves since you'll be interacting with everyone in the, in the chat. So, um, Andrew, you're first on my, my uh, carousel here. Do you want to say hello? Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Andrew Nudigat. I am a distinguished engineer in the infrastructure team at GitLab. Um, and so what that means is that mostly I focus on GitLab.com and trying to make sure it scales and trying to make sure that all the different uh, engineering teams are coordinated and sort of pulling in the right direction or the same direction at least. Um, and I'm from South Africa. I lived in the UK for 17 years and I returned here in uh, back to Cape Town in 2019. And I'm super happy to be back, enjoying the sunshine and the space and the mountains in Cape Town. And uh, just really thankful that I work for a for a remote company that I could, you know, close my laptop in London, move across the world, open it up and carry on working. Um, and that's me. PJ, you're next. Hi, uh, I'm PJ. I'm the education evangelist. So I work on a team with uh, Dr. Christina Hubie. And what we do is we are focused on um, uh, getting uh, licenses of GitLab to uh, students and uh, really to their educators so that students can use it. Uh, right now we're focusing on doing that with universities and uh, I always hope to do uh, to expand that in the future. Um, but I was a former high school teacher and uh, I taught high school English for 10 years. So literature and poetry and stuff like that. And then I started learning to code in 2020. And in 2021, I started working at GitLab as a evangelist here. So I'm really happy to be here. I'm excited to be a part of this team. Um, Christina is one of my favorite people. So this is fantastic to be able to work with someone who so closely understands education the way that I do. And um, yeah, that's me. I think uh, Fatima is probably next. Uh, hi, my name is Fatwa. I am a developer evangelist uh, on the community relations team at GitLab. Um, I am what's called the voice of the customer, the voice of our developer customer. So uh, I work with PJ and Christina quite a bit as well. Um, I'm new to uh, GitLab. It's only been three months. Uh, traditionally, I've been a software engineer, and this has just been a really great role to work on not only communicating with the developer community and kind of putting out technical blog posts and things like that, but also just being part of this like worldwide remote job community. And so that's been really great for me. I've never really had a fully remote job. So. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. So we also have Victor um, Nagy joining us and he is over in Europe. Uh, and he'll be coming in a little bit past the hour here uh, and share some more once we kind of break down uh, and do a panel discussion in the Q&A. Uh, and he is a product uh, product manager. So we'll talk about a little bit about what product managers are as well and um, how they interact with, with engineers. So awesome. So we will definitely want this to be an interactive session. Uh, and everyone can see my screen, I'm assuming, at this point in time. Yes, okay, awesome. So what we're going to do today is I want to spend a little bit of time about um, talking about kind of what is a tech company and what are the different kinds of jobs that you can have at a tech company and, and how a tech company is structured. Um, when we were meeting with Seth, Seth and Gina um, and, and, and you know, talking about what we wanted to cover today, one of the things that stood out was really helping all of, all of you understand how tech engineering fits into the structure of a company and how we collaborate across different teams. Um, and so I think having that overview of where you know you would fit in really helps give that context, especially when you're going for an interview. Um, and so we hope that that's that's interesting. And then we'll talk a little bit about what it's like every day working at an all remote company more and more. You'll find that uh, there's remote jobs and engineering jobs, especially so uh, it's an exciting time to uh, to work in this area. And then um, we'll have some special guests talk a little bit more in detail about how they use GitLab. They're going to do kind of a five minute demo of um, how they use GitLab every day. And then we can ask them some, some specific questions about uh, their role. So we want it to be interactive. So I'll be monitoring the chat and my teammates will help me as well. And uh, so we'll take some pauses throughout to an answer some questions and ask questions. And we would love to have you off camera if you're comfortable, uh, but you can also just use the chat as well. 
All right, so let's talk a little bit about what the tech industry is. I think all of you obviously are in a software development and engineering program, so you know that it's going to involve some kind of software and it's going to have a development process um, associated with it. So that's that's a basic thing. Uh, I like to show this slide because it covers you know, the breadth of different companies that are considered part of the tech industry. So um, I'm sure some of you recognize some logos on, on this. Um, on this uh, slide here. And the one that I'll, I'll pick on is Netflix. You might think that Netflix is a, a movie company or a company that, that services, that allows people to watch movies, which it is, it's a streaming service, right? But it's the technology behind it that allows them to actually let you watch those movies. Uh, without, so, so technically they're not a movie dis distribution company, they're a streaming platform and the platform is software. And so uh, one of the exciting things about the industry that you're working in and the skills that you're learning as part of We Think Code is there are so many different places uh, that you can go and work and build software. Uh, if you want to help people watch movies better, if you want to help people connect on social, uh, there's some gaming companies here that you may notice. Uh, there's there's big enterprise companies. NVIDIA is a, is a company that helps uh, get graphics to display properly um, on your screen. So there's just so many different areas. Um, and at GitLab, we like to say that software is eating the world. And this is a quote by um, Mark Andreessen, who was a, uh, a investor in, in these tech companies. So oftentimes someone will have an idea, they build a prototype, and then they go get funding by uh, what we call venture capitalists. And Mark Andreessen was a, a venture capitalist. And he basically said a couple of years ago that every company is going to need to be a software company to compete in the marketplace today. That's just the way commerce is, is moving. And we like to use the example of a, of a salad company. So there's a new salad company that came out called Sweetgreen. And they, um, they, they basically make salads. And you may say, well, what, is, what, what do salads have to do with tech? Well, when, when Sweetgreen went public uh, on the, and got listed as a public company on the stock exchange, uh, they listed themselves as a tech company. And you're thinking, well, what does salad have to do with tech? Well, the reason they listed themselves as a tech company is because it's the app that allows them to effectively and efficiently serve their customers and let them customize their salads and put what they want on it and come from their office or their home and walk in and pick up their salad that's perfectly made and walk out the door. And that allows them to scale, right? And maybe you've been, um, you know, to, maybe you've ordered, pre-ordered food online before that may be an experience that you've had, or maybe you've ordered something and it showed up at your, at your door or at your office or at your school. And so it's that same idea, right? It's not that you're selling salad in this case, it's a tech company because they're building technology that better serves their customers. Um, and, and we like that at GitLab, obviously, because as you probably know, I know you all are using GitLab. Uh, we are a platform that allows people to build software better and faster and in a more collaborative way. Uh, and here are some, some of the leading organizations that are using DevOps. Um, T-Mobile is a great example. That's us. Um, they, they obviously sell a cell, cellular network and phones and phone services. But everything that they built um, that runs those systems is built on GitLab. Uh, UBS is a major banking system, and I've all, all the financial software that runs their bank is, is built uh, on GitLab as well. Uh, Ticketmaster sells tickets uh, here in the US. I'm not sure if they're international or not, but um, in the US, it's Ticketmaster. And uh, it's an app where you go online and you get in a queue to buy tickets for concerts. Uh, and are there any here, if you want to raise your hand, that you recognize GitLab, uh, GitLab customers? Anyone recognize some, some customers? Some of them maybe, let's see, I think maybe, okay, Cloud Native Computing Foundation. All right, so maybe some of them stand out a little bit. Um, so what I want to do now, NVIDIA, good, good, wish. Okay, excellent. So a few of those stand out. Uh, what I want to do next is take a look, little bit of a look at how tech companies are organized. 
And I thought that it would be, um, you know, a good comparison to look at how a school is organized or a school board as just a starting point. So if we have a school district, generally we have a board of education, which is made up um, by volunteers uh, who, who volunteer to run and they get voted in and they kind of guide what happens in the, in the school district. Then we have our superintendent and the superintendent is in charge of all the schools within the district. And then for each individual school, we may have um, an executive director for student services. So this is things like special programs and health and guidance counseling. Um, and then we have an executive director that manages all of our principals. Um, and this is middle school and elementary. It's kind of the primary schools uh, that you may refer to there. And then we have personnel and business services and, and food and maintenance. Um, and then if we break it down even farther, you think of your individual school, you have a principal, and then you have all the teachers, and maybe you have an athletic director, um, and maybe you have a director of student services. So this is what we call an organizational chart. Uh, and what I want to do next is I want to look at what an organizational chart for a company uh, like GitLab or any of these tech companies would look like. And again, we want to share this with you so that you have that context to kind of where you fit into uh, the overall structure in a company as you're going out to interview. So, oops, my animation uh, didn't fail a little bit there. So you got one answer. But um, what I want you all to do is just take a minute and sketch out what you think a um the functions of a tech company are and these are going to be the major think of a function as a category so what are the major different areas that are organized um set has his hand raised set do you want to say something oh you're uh, sorry i i forgot to put that down <laughs> oh you're fine oh you're fine uh, I just thought it pop up on my screen for some reason. So what I want everyone to do is take a minute, and if you have a piece of paper next to you, um, jot down, there's seven, that's a hint, there's seven. And I'm gonna give you one example so that you have a good starting point. So when you're out there and you're looking for a job um, and you see a job ad and you apply, you're gonna get an interview, right? And the interview is generally gonna be from someone on the people team. So that would be human resources. That's one example. So there's human resources, and generally that's someone that we would call the, who's in charge of that function is the chief people officer. So we have the chief people officer, and they're in charge of, one of the things that they're in charge of is hiring. And another thing that they're in charge of is, is benefits. So your salary, right? And if you get health insurance um, and all of that kind of stuff. So, so that's one example, there's seven total. So I'm gonna give everyone a minute and then we will, um, we will check with the audience and see what everyone thinks. And I'm gonna stop sharing for a second. And if you do a sketch, we would love if you would come off camera and um, if you're in gallery view, you'll be able to see. All right, does anyone want to come off camera and show their sketch? Any volunteers? Tina, I see you have your camera off. Would you like to show yours? Hey, I'm still working on it. If you Tina. want to read a few of them to us, that would be great. So what do you have so far? Ooh. 
It's okay. It has, it has, do you want to read a few of them to us? My, my, okay, wait, give me like a second. Sure, no problem. We'll move, we'll move on to the, um, we have one from the chat. So we have Monique who said production, research and developing, research and development, purchasing, sales, marketing, human resource management, accounting and finance. That's, that's pretty close. That is pretty close. Anyone else? We have sales from John. IT department. That's a good guess as well. Anyone else? Yeah, IT department is essential, right? And that's one of the cool things about GitLab is that GitLab is actually used in IT. So it's often used to help companies uh, function. So there's something called infrastructure as code where you manage your infrastructure with GitLab as well. All right, we've got some good examples. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen again. Got a good start. And I fixed my animation there. So, um, so I'm going to go ahead and, and, and walk you through this and please ask, ask questions as we're going along and um, PJ and the team can, can help answer. So uh, just like a school board, a company generally is going to have a board of directors, especially if they were given investment money. And the board of directors are experts from kind of across the tech industry who have served in different roles. So maybe they've worked in legal or they've worked in product or they've had an experience taking a company from a startup to, um, to a big enterprise company. And so the board of directors is typically eight to 10 people and they sit outside of the company. So they're kind of like a guiding, you know, like a guiding body. And, and the CEO generally is part of that board um, but the CEO also kind of reports to the board. So the CEO is the one that presents. Generally, it's every quarter and they're presenting things like major changes in direction and strategy. And then also, um, of course, the finances, right? Because that's what the board of directors is, is often very interested in. And then the company, of course, at the top is led by the, by the CEO. And then uh, the people team is the first one that I already mentioned. So the people team is also, also often called eight human resources. So here we have things like, uh, like I mentioned, hiring and uh, benefits, and then also um, learning and development. So making a plan for how your employees are going to um, get better over time. Uh, and I know that I got a chance to talk to several, I think there were three or maybe two or three of you in here that um, I did get to do mock interviews with. And one of the things that um, one of the pointers I gave everyone in the mock interview sessions um, was that you're always going to get asked a question on, you know, where do you see yourself in five years? And you want to be able to be prepared to talk about where you see your career going. And then also um, one of the great questions that you can ask uh, uh, the interviewer is, what are the opportunities for me to get better and learn? And that often falls in learning and development, which is under the people team. So a good company is going to invest in you and give you resources to learn and grow. And that's often on the people team. Uh, then we have the legal team. So that was one that I didn't notice in the examples. So we have a chief uh, le legal officer and her name is Robin Shulman. Uh, and she's, uh, she was a lawyer and, and worked in different legal capacities. And her, um, her job is pretty specific. She runs a team that makes sure that we're following the rules in all of the different com company, countries that we're operating in. So she helps us uh, make sure we're following the finance rules. Now we're a public company. So there's a lot of rules that we need to follow in terms of what kind of information we can disclose and not disclose. Uh, she also makes sure that we're following uh, laws for employment and then um, general laws for uh, with the people team as well. So making sure that if there's incidents that happen, that we have the proper procedures in place. So that's the legal team. 
And then of course we have engineering. Um, so engineering is really the heart of where that software is built. So this is where you're going to have uh, all of your software developers are going to report up to engineering. Uh, I noticed also that information technology was listed. So oftentimes the, the hardware and the systems that are going to uh, drive what you're able to build, that's gonna fall under engineering. So often that's not a separate department, it just aligns up to engineering. Um, and then also often uh, you need a software to be able to sell your software. Uh, that sounds kind of silly, but we have um, gitlab.com, which is our platform. And then we have customers.gitlab.com, which is what we would call fulfillment. That may be a new word for you, but fulfillment is basically I, I give GitLab money, GitLab gives me software. That transaction has to happen somewhere and it has to be recorded and passed through all of our bookkeeping. And so there's engineers who work just on our fulfillment team and they're building the ability for customers to pay us, uh, which is pretty important, right? In an effective and efficient way. Um, and then there's revenue. So we saw, I know John mentioned sales and I think Monica mentioned sales as well. Uh, and so um, sales is a good one. Uh, oh, we had someone, so John mentioned security, um, and security is going to fall under, if it's security of our own product, I think, Andrew, am I right in saying that that is going to be under engineering security? Yes, security is, uh, is an engineering team. Uh, yes, it is. Yes, and it's interesting in GitLab because we also have security features that are in our product, and so we have a, a specialization in product that's security as well. So, um, all right, and then we have finance. Uh, so finance is different than, oh, sorry, I skipped ahead because uh, I saw the question about security. Um, revenue is obviously our sales. So this is where we're going to have a sales team. And our sales team is organized by, believe it or not, regions of the world. And then secondly, sectors. So we call the sectors enterprise, which is your big companies. So think of something like a Facebook or a Google or T-Mobile or UBS, um, Goldman Sachs, those are enterprise com companies and they have uh, tens of thousands of employees. That's how we, we organize that. So, so if there's tens of thousands of employees, um, then it's going to be enterprise. And then we would have a commercial, which is just under that. So maybe they have you know, a couple thousand employees and then it's mid-market and small business. So small business would be kind of your um, smaller startups, a couple hundred employees, that kind of idea. And so um, one area that's also in revenue that I wanted to mention is something called customer success. Um, and customer success is a really cool area to work in uh, because you, you have to have technical skills and you need to know how to code and develop, but you're not just building software. So let's just say you're in the WeThink code program and you're really good at coding um, and you like what you're doing and you like building software, but you think, gosh, you know, I really wanna be able to um, solve customer problems, or I really like talking to lots of different people rather than say maybe coding all day, um, or I like the challenge of, of interacting with people and really helping them solve something. That There's a position called a solutions architect, and I encourage all of you to write that down um, and take a look at a job ad for that if, if that sounds like something that's interesting. So it's technical skills, but customer facing. So you would be meeting, say, with the people at T-Mobile and helping them build their systems um, to be successful. And also under revenue is something called professional services. And that's a little bit more where um, a company would uh, pay you to help them build something. So you may be like an engineer in residence where you go work at T-Mobile for a couple of months and you help them on a project that they might not, that they don't have the expertise in house to do. And they pay separately, you know, they pay separately for that. So that's another really good area um, for all of you to, to look into is customer success and professional services. And thanks to my team for answering all the questions in the chat as well. So then we have finance and that's really where you're going to have your accounting um, and keeping track of the books and measuring everything. 
That one's pretty straightforward. And then there's product. Um, and product is another really interesting place to work because it's, um, it's really how you decide the vision and the features and what's going to be built in the software. Um, and so a product engineer really looks at what does the customer want to be able to do and how do we bring that to the product? And product and engineering work really closely together because the product um, team, the product managers define the scope of what the engineers are going to build. They also define the priorities of what the engineers are going to build. So if you like software and you're finding that maybe, you know, coding isn't necessarily your thing, being a product manager is a great way to still work with the technology and set the direction without actually building it yourself. And the cool thing is, is you get to work with great engineers uh, all the time. So that's an exciting place to work as well. And then, engine, and then marketing is one of the last ones uh, that we'll mention. And marketing is really where uh, we promote the product, right? We get the brand out. So when you think of graphic design, and you think of planning events, and you think of webinars and, and managing our website, all of that falls into marketing. And marketing really is the champions of what everyone else is doing. And that's, um, yeah, product promotion and branding. Yeah, that's, that's a great, great part of it. And um, it's, it's, it's fun, and especially with, um, I think PJ and uh, Fatima are great examples of that because they have a technical background, but they're taking that technology and bringing it out to the user community. And so um, that's another really interesting career track is called developer relations. And developer relations are really the liaison between uh, what's happening in the technology and the people who are using it. And it's also very uh, based on promotion. So a lot of social media, tweeting about functions and uh, writing blog posts and a lot of speaking at conferences. So we have a team of five developer evangelists. They spend a lot of time traveling, a lot of time speaking. And their job is so cool because all they're doing is learning technology, literally. That's all, that's all they're doing is learning technology, keeping up with things, and sh sharing the word, sharing the world, um, sharing the word. And we really encourage you, maybe um, PJ and Fatima, if you could uh, maybe share some of the names, our Twitter handles of our developer evangelists in the chat. Um, that would be awesome. They, they, those are great people to follow on Twitter to kind of keep up with what's going on in technology. And then we also have um, our chief of staff and the chief of staff is kind of like a special forces of um, a company. And what they do is they help keep special projects that cross um, that cross these different divisions moving forward. So they will go in and really help um, something that's cross functional, meaning Maybe it involves engineering, marketing, and product, or different sub teams, something that's important to everyone, move forward. Um, so the chief of staff is, if you're into operations and you're, getting pe you're interested in getting people to agree and move forward and make fast decisions, then the chief of staff is a great, great place for you. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and click on our handbook and I'll put it here in the, um, in the chat so that you can see our handbook uh, and this really kind of goes through that structure so we have our people group and i would love to spend more time on this but we i don't want to i don't want to bore you too much but engineering marketing um sales and here's that customer success that i mentioned and then finance product and legal so i would love for all of you especially if you're interested in engineering to kind of take a look at these different areas um, that, that you can work in engineering. And I mentioned fulfillment. Um, I think we mentioned security. Uh, we also mentioned, we had questions about infrastructure uh, and oh, the full security department here. This is a subgroup um, within development, but this is the full security. And then we also have UX. So UX is user experience. And I know that some of you did a bunch of front end engineering in your program. So that fits into the UX department. Uh, and one of the amazing things about GitLab, which we're, which is going to be the subject topic of our subject for the next few minutes, is how we work together. And our handbook really has a lot of different things in it, including kind of our operating procedures. And so what's amazing is that you can come in here and look at how does our UX 
department work. Um, and technical writing falls under here. That's one thing that we didn't mention. So there's so much to talk about there. Um, but we're going to go ahead and move on uh, and talk a little bit about GitLab and how we work. So GitLab is um, the open DevOps platform. We were incorporated in 2015. We have um, over 1,000 employees in 65 different countries. Um, and we're all remote. And that's one of the things that I want to talk about, because I think probably a lot of you are wondering, how is it that you work remotely? Um, and I want to show this this, this figure uh, because I know all of you use uh, GitLab, but you may not have seen kind of the, the bird's eye view of what it is that we do. And the idea is that we're bringing together the development side where you plan, create, um, verify your software to the operations side where you release, configure, and monitor it. And we're the first platform that brings all of this together in a single location with a single source of truth um, in a simple data model. And, and I hope that you have that experience as you're using it. It's one place to log in to do all of these different pieces of the software development lifecycle. Um, and what we're finding is that it helps customers build software much faster than using lots of different, um, different tools. And so how do we do it? How do we work in um, 65 countries with over a thousand people and uh, make all of this come together? Sometimes you have to stop in the middle of the day and think, do I, where is this place? Where do I work? How does this all happen? Uh, so I wanna talk a little bit about remote. So there's a kind of a transect of how companies work remotely. Some of them um, don't, are not, they don't allow remote at all. You have to be in the office every day. And if you're not there, it's a sick day or it's a vacation day, uh, or you're traveling for work, obviously. All the way over to all remote, uh, which is the case of GitLab. So we have no physical office. Uh, we, we, our address that we list in our bills is actually our, our CEO, Sid C. Brandy, um, his, his, his apartment. Uh, and so really we have no physical, physical address. We started off having one, and then we found out that people really didn't need, need to come to an office, right? So um, there are different variations here. We're big proponents of working all remotely all the time because we feel that it gives the best experience for our employees. That, that's a topic we could talk about, but um, it's not one that I want to spend too much time on today. But just to give you an idea, there is kind of this transact. Um, and we're actually pretty good at it, which is pretty cool. Uh, we've won a lot of awards. Um, we're, a t we're we win top 100, top 10 awards. Um, and so we've, we've done a lot of work in figuring out how to do this well. And so I wanna share some of those um, challenges or share some of those best practices with you. But first, I wanna hear from the audience and ask uh, what you think some of the biggest challenges would be for a company like ours, where we have over a thousand people working for us in 65 countries. And what do you think some of the biggest challenges um, would be? So I would love to um, hear in the chat what you think our top three challenges are. We hear time zones. Yes, absolutely. Slacking. Tina, do you want to expand on why you think slacking is a, is a challenge? Do you mean slacking as in slack or slacking as in not doing your, not doing your work? Having a low network connection, that is definitely a challenge. Language barrier. Yeah, I mean, as in not doing your work, access to hardware. Yeah, poor internet it can definitely be a barrier. Those are all great, great examples. Home family distractions, yes. Um, Maggie hit that one on the head. That is one of the top three. Uh, so Maggie gets a star for that one. Um, work, work home life balance uh, is, is one of our top three challenges. Fatigue, juggling calendars, very good. These are all awesome. So there's a lot of challenges. Time zone is one for sure. Uh, so the ones that, that we, we state in our handbook are, are work-life separation, um, communication, 
and then mindset and culture, right? So the, the first one is, you know, here I'm in my home, my daughters are getting ready for school in the next room so I can hear them banging around. Hopefully they're, they're not too loud. Um, you know, my dogs will let themselves in and out. And then it, particularly in the summer, it's really hard because in the summer here in the US, kids aren't in school. So my kids are running around, they want me to drive in places, they have friends over, they're super loud. Um, they, you know, come walking behind me and distract me. And it's just, it's, it's difficult, right? So, and also um, walking out of here at the end of the day and not coming back in. Right, because a lot of people um, who work at GitLab are what we would call managers of one. So I think it was Tina who said slacking off is something that is a challenge, and um, I, I definitely think that that's that that is very true. I will say that our recruiting team does a great job of hiring people who are self motivated and self driven and what we call managers of one because you, no one is here watching what I'm no one is here watching what I'm doing right except my dogs during the day and so I could just decide to go take a nap or go take a bike ride and do whatever and the beauty of it is I can I have I have gone said you know what I I need to walk away and go take a, a bike ride I know PJ does as well because I'm, I'm held to metrics. I'm held to what my results are. And if I can get to my results, if I need a break to help me get power through the afternoon, that's fine. There's no clock. I don't have to check in. If I need an, if I have a headache, I need to go take a nap. I do, I do that. And then I figure out how to make it up later. So I'm the manager of one. Um, and so we have to do that up, up front, right? We have to do that at the very beginning. And then communication is the biggest one. So yeah, um, Isaac just said keeping track of GitLab issues, right? So we use GitLab a lot. And that's one of the things that our team members are going to share here in a little bit is how we use GitLab to, um, to communicate. And then really keeping our culture is important. So um, we have a, a culture here that, that uh, spells the acronym CREDIT, which is Collaboration, Results, Efficiency, Diversity, Iteration, and Transparency. Um, and that is, uh, these values together are essential for us to be able to be, be successful. And the values were in that handbook link, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about them here, um, because if you're interested, please take a look, but it kind of weaves throughout the rest of the, the presentation. Um, so I wanted just to talk a little bit about kind of what a day in the life looks like for me. So we can, um, as I'm sh sharing some of the examples, you have that context. I know that Gina and Seth said, everyone like wants to know what, what does your actual day look like? And this is my calendar from a few weeks ago. And you'll see that here's the mock interviews that I was doing uh, with the team uh, at We Think Code. Um, and then every day I try to have some, especially on Monday, an in inbox zero. So looking at my to-do list, cleaning things out. Um, this happened to be a week where I had some, you know, learning and development stuff on my calendar. So um, this is a session uh, as well on learning and development. Uh, here is a reminder to write us a, a support, a letter of support. And I was working with the legal team on that. Uh, this is a, a, a company-wide efficiency project that's a stand-up. So some of you maybe have heard of a stand-up where you all come together and update each other on projects. Uh, and this is my one-on-one -on -one with, with PJ. So all of our team members, we have a one-on-one -on -one where we check in and talk about what we're going to work on for the week. And then PJ kind of goes and does his thing and we communicate um, uh, asynchronously throughout the week. And so this kind of gives you an idea of, of what a typical calendar looks like. And you can see that I block some times for myself where I've got something going on Friday morning. I like to go to yoga. We have no um, in-person, usually no in-person meetings. These were some external meetings uh, and some other block times for me uh, that are on my calendar. So again, an example of manager of one. So how do we do this? How do we function remotely? Um, I think using GitLab is the most important part of this. Uh, working in issues. And, and when we pull everyone on screen here in a little bit, we're going to show you, we're going to demonstrate what those issues uh, look like. Zoom, obviously we're on Zoom now. So when we meet in person uh, over Zoom, we're using Zoom. Uh, we also use Slack a lot to communicate kind of those momentary, um, uh, more synchronous work. 
So with Slack, we delete our Slack every 60 days. So Slack is not meant as a source of, of truth or record. It's more for uh, conversations that are happening uh, you know, in the moment or, um, and it's also fun. We have a lot of fun Slack channels. There's a dog channel. I'm in that one. There's a um, exercise channel. Uh, there is a channel for food, uh, certain kinds of food. There's a channel for people who are super into coffee. <laughs> uh, and there's actually a key keyboards are a thing. People are all fired up about their keyboards. And so there's a, <laughs> um, a, a, a channel about keyboards. So, and then we use YouTube. So we record every single meeting and we put it on YouTube unless it has sensitive information. And then we have a private YouTube channel that we can use. And that means that anyone in any time zone around the world can participate in a meeting by watching it. And we also use Google Docs to ask questions for the meeting ahead of time. So I know we had a time zone question before. Uh, it's a really good example of we have a meeting invite. There's an agenda. Someone from South Africa, if the meeting is in Pacific time in the US, can come into the agenda, write a question, then when the meeting happens, the question is answered and typed out and it's also recorded. So if Andrew wants to attend a meeting in the Pacific time, he can do that asynchronously. So those are just some of the examples of the tools that we use. Um, we also use our handbook, which I already shared with you. I know PJ just posted it again, a link to our values. So we really encourage you to take a look at that. Um, because uh, it, it, it is a wealth of information, honestly. I think, what are we, what are we saying at? It's now over, I don't want to quote it because I'm, I'm alive, but it's the thousands of, of pages of, of how we operate. And it's really super valuable information. Um, and then we actually have a communication handbook and we have some best practices. So I want to stop again here and see if anyone can think of a, I know some of you have been working remotely. What do you think some of the challenges are of, of communicating remotely? Have you run into any challenges with communicating remotely? Lag, audio issues, great examples. So you and um, uh, I'm, I'm not trying to say anything. You not be. When you mean lag, do you mean a delay in the the signal or a delay in the response time? Anyone else want to think of an example um, between about sometimes people just being unavailable? Yeah. So uh, what about uh, what about besides technical issues? What do you think are some of the other challenges that you might might have or that you've experienced? Something feels very urgent, <laughs> PJ. I want an answer now, right? So, so Christina, I've, I've got a bit of a uh, some experience to relay, which is the, the struggle of trying to explain um, yeah. things without a uh, you know without hands and a whiteboard and things like that so uh, we try to use tools like Miro and such but it, it's just so much easier to to be sitting down with a person and trying to communicate okay what is the actual problem that you have and you know how do we go if we can go about solving that so essentially just being able to pair and uh, you know communicate in a, in a more natural way I, yeah, I absolutely agree with that. And I think there's nothing like a good whiteboard and there's nothing about being able to read those visual pauses, right? I'm stopping, I'm pausing, I'm talking. So um, people not pe people not showing up on time, right? Um, yeah, no water cooler chats where ideas get bounced. I agree with that as well, Maggie, um, for sure. And I think those are all in, we just have a few more slides left to, to, to kind of cover what we, what we try to do to, to handle some of those. Um, I think one of the other things that Seth mentioned is, is important too is, uh, is the context, right? You, you, you know, when you're communicating remotely, it tends to be more succinct. And so you don't have that context, right? And that's a big challenge, a uh, big challenge of communicating, especially over Slack 
is you can ask someone a question and it could be interpreted a lot of different, different ways, right? And maybe you don't have the full context. Um, and so there's a couple different things that we do at GitLab to kind of get, a, you know, to help us. And one of them that I love is assuming positive intent. Uh, and we actually had it brought in a communication specialist that was fascinating. I think it's on YouTube. So maybe, maybe if the team, you know, if um, I can share it with after if, if the team or PJ can't find it, but we had a communication specialist come in for a lunch and learning talk a little bit ago. And she actually talked about using emojis and, and exclamation points. And, you know, someone said, I feel like if, if someone doesn't use an, an exclamation point after every sentence, they're being too serious. And so we've kind of gotten in this mode of really looking at those nuances of, is there an emoji? Is there an, you know, is there an exclamation point? And I think just assuming positive intent, even if there isn't an exclamation point is a great start, right? Um, always assuming a positive intent is part of what really makes GitLab successful. Um, assuming low context. So meaning that I'm always going to explain before I ask or before I make a, D, a DM or a, 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 a succinct message, I'm going to say, in the discussion on this issue, we were talking about this. Can you help me da 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 or whatever? We're going to provide that context. So we're always going to assume the person does not know what we're talking about. And that really is, a, is huge. Um, being kind, you know, expressing your thoughts, being a role map model. Um, and again, some of our remote work competencies are there as well. And, and that's, that's in the, the handbook. And PJ um, just linked a great um, YouTube video as well on asynchronous communication. And oh, it's, PJ found it, tone and text-based communication. That is a great presentation by an expert speaker on the subject. Highly recommend checking that out. Um, another thing that we do is, oops, um, another thing that we do is we, everything has a link. So anytime that we are, um, we're adding something, it always includes a link to everything. So you can see on this page, everything is linked. Um, every meeting has an agenda. So this is an example of what we were talking about before. So we always post ahead of time, the invites, and then the agenda and people can come in here and ask questions, even if they're not able to attend, say they're with their kids or they are um, in a different time zone and we write down the answer and then we also record it. So that's another great um, tip and trick of the trade. So everything starts with a merge request. We're very GitLab based. So if you have an idea or a suggestion, we always start with a merge request. Um, we don't use email, which is really, really awesome. It was one of the main selling points to me um, of working the GitLab is that we do not use email at all. It's in a GitLab issue, it's in a Google Doc, or it's in Slack. Uh, we also have fun. So we have a lot of fun channels. I know someone mentioned earlier about uh, making sure that, um, that, you know, or missing that water cooler experience. We use Slack for that as much as we can. And we also have daily company-wide chats. It's like, it's a chit chat invite where you can hop in and chit chat with people um, and you can hop out as well. So it's, it's really kind of um, up, up, up to you to, to join and, and find people that have common um, interests. Also, we, we, we really, try to minimize meetings so that you can do your work as effectively as you can. Um, and we only call meetings if we need to. So uh, do we need to talk about it synchronously or can we do it asynchronously? Uh, we also do lots of fun things like talent shows and uh, we have, we've had fun speakers come in. Um, we have AMAs where we can ask Sid questions about what he did over the weekend and what he thinks about a certain band. Uh, people have asked him if he thinks there's aliens or not. Uh, I can find that one. It's a pretty interesting discussion. So <laughs> PJ's laughing. That was a great, that, that one went on a really fun tangent <laughs> to hear Sid talk about um, his, his theory. And, and he actually, actually shared some theories that we're all in a simulation. 
Uh, so it was kind of a wild day at GitLab. So there's lots of fun ways to interact. And uh, I'm sharing here my, um, my contact information. Uh, I'm on Twitter and LinkedIn, and so is PJ. And then this link here is going to take you uh, to a bunch of different things, resources in our GitLab for Education page. And I can share this uh, with, um, I know, we, Gina, we probably didn't think of that, I had time to share that PowerPoint, but I can, I can make a PDF and make it available to the students and alumni as well. Um, so at this point, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing. And um, we've been doing a great, uh, a great job of uh, answering questions in the chat. Um, so what I'd like to do is just open it up and see if there's any other questions at this point, and then we have um, some special guests to bring on stage. I think it looks like the chat's pretty good. So let's go ahead and um, we have a, a good chunk of time here to do some, some demonstrations of how different teams use GitLab, and then we can do um, Q&A as we go along. So uh, I thought what we would do is first, um, Victor, do you want to uh, be the first one to go? Is that all right? Sure. Okay, so I'm going to hand the mic over to Victor. Gina, if you wouldn't mind giving uh, Victor Nagy uh, uh, the ability to host and Victor's going to uh, share his screen and talk just for about five minutes on kind of what he does. He's a, a very uh, well, well known and uh, just an amazing product manager at GitLab. So you're getting a very special, um, special guest, Victor. I'm going to hand the mic over to you. Thank you. So let me quickly share my screen. Uh, I, as it's only five minutes, actually, I'm just going to show two slides of this deck. That's why it's not full screen, etc. If you don't know what product managers do, there are two sides, discovery and delivery. Uh, basically, discovery focuses on us connecting with users, user problems, uh, trying to figure them out, speaking with analysts, going out uh, to see the market around us and all that stuff. And at the core, I would just re-emphasize the users. So that's, that's what the discovery aspect is about. Within GitLab, this means as well, try to do something called dog fooding, which means that for example, here's Andrew on the call. He works uh, with our infrastructure and my team is pretty much infrastructure oriented. So I try to read their Slack uh, on a daily basis and see what, what are their daily problems, how do they do their work. And from time to time, I jump on their team calls just to listen in, so nothing more special. And then there is the de delivery aspect where we try to deliver solutions to the problems that were identified during discovery. So that's the, the product management job. And I'm not doing any of this. I'm just collecting the problems, trying to simplify them uh, in a way so it's easy to understand and somebody uh, switched on the microphone. Uh, and then the development team can deliver a solution. Of course, for all of this to work, I have to work pretty closely to the development team, even in the discovery phase, not just in delivery. So because they have to understand the problem in the end. And Christina already spoke about that, like how we do that through issues with many ways, the Loom videos and everything else, sometimes even Slack messages, sometimes sync calls, but mostly asynchronous. The other slide that I wanted to share is very similar to Christina's screenshot. Uh, this is again, uh, similar to Christina in the sense that when I created this deck like two months ago, I took two days, consecutive days, randomly from my calendar and wrote out what I did. What you can see here on day one was I start with Slack. That's pretty typical. The same happens on day two. Uh, and then I had a customer interview, then went back to Slack or my to-do list. I will give you a, a quick view of my to-do list if time allows. And then made lunch. Um, this is great about remote work that you can you have this luxury of cooking if you like to cook or um, to hoping on your bike and visit a friend and have a lunch together if you prefer that. And I continued with my, with the issues that were assigned or where I was mentioned in the afternoon. That mostly means discussions with engineers, uh, customers, the designer or technical writer that I work with most closely. And as I work from Europe, 
at around three o'clock in the afternoon, my the the meeting starts, so to say. This is one really uh, interesting situ uh, consequence of working remotely is that my afternoon hours are extremely scarce. Everybody wants to have the meetings there because the majority of the team is US based, not my engineering team, but the GitLab team itself. So that's where we have to put all the meetings in. But at the same time, and this is where values are really important, being family and friends first work second means that I'm not expected to work outside regular working hours. It's totally up to me. And then if you look, look at the second day, it was either Tuesday or Friday because that's when I go to swim. Uh, you can do that uh, if you work remotely. Uh, then probably I had a lunch with my brother actually at that specific day because he, we often go to swim together. But otherwise it's very, very similar to the, to the first day in terms of starting with Slack, working on issues, refining those issues, working with designer, technical writer, having some live chats uh, on the second day. This is, I, I guess, Krista mentioned something we call coffee chats. Uh, that's what I, I had there. And again, customer interview on the East Coast. And here I ended later, but if you look at it, I wasn't really working in the morning hours. So I, was, I went to swim and then had lunch. So that's totally, uh, it's extremely flexible as a result. Um, this, this is what I wanted to share. I'm going to stop it and then I can see any chat messages that you have. Okay, I think nothing specifically for me. That's great. Oh, and I wanted to give you a quick peek into my to-do list. I think there's nothing. Yes, we would love to see your to-do list, Victor, and then maybe also any of the boards or anything that you can share a yeah. little bit about how product works would be great. Yeah, yeah. that's that's what I want to just, I think I, yeah. now, 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 now you just see the window and it might be easier for you. So this is my to-do list. I was out the past three days, so now I have 40 to-dos. Uh, typically, I have less than 10. So one of my goals for the next week will be to get it below probably 20 and then the following week, I should reach under 10. Um, just to give you a, a peek into whom I work with most closely, Nicolo is the engine manager from Italy. He actually lives in Hungary, um, just 30 minutes away from me. Thibaut Blanchard, I, I, very likely that he is a customer, a user of GitLab, and they're actually providing feedback. Justin Mendel, uh, the designer I was working with until we hired Ali, who is my current designer counterpart. And Mark Nunzo, he's one of the engineering directors. Alana is another product manager, a product director, user. I don't really know who Peter Lanson is, but I know that he's a GitLab team member. I don't know his role. Uh, one, of, one of the engineers in my team, Michael is not on the call. He's a developer evangelist. Uh, one of my favorite users is Timo Ferrer, actually. Technical writer, counterpart, another engineer uh, from my team. And you can see technical writer is relatively active here. So this is typically whom I work with. And what I do, as you can see in the tabs, I have, I typically, when, when I go to the issues, I open several of them and respond to each of them one by one. After that, the to-do list, those to-dos are cleared. Depending on the time I have, I might go to the next batch of to-dos. And when I get under 10, then I, then typically I look at uh, more demanding, issues that I have that require more focus and in-depth uh, thinking, or I have specific time set up for those to, to tackle. And in terms of boards, in the configure group, we actually use two boards, one for planning and another one for delivery. And here, no, not here, but here, you can see that what we have is there are issues that are in refinement. All the columns are kept prioritized. I try to look at them every third day or fourth day, at least once a week for sure, but more like twice. And I make sure that the issue list is prioritized. So engineers, when they have some time or when they ask to refine something, they can just pick the top ones if they were not mentioned specifically on, a, on an issue. 
and once they apply the ready for development labels, it just moves on here. I make sure this is prioritized as well. So whenever we plan for the following iteration, then they can easily move stuff to deliver the stretch columns that we call. It's, it's kind of like in sprint planning, you just sign up for a sprint and you said, yes, this is what we want to deliver knowing that uh, the final items might not fit actually the, the sprint. Here, stretch is the same, that which likely won't fit the milestone, but we at least want to start working on it and want to finish it in the next iteration. And deliverables that you really want to deliver deliver in that uh, area. Oh, I forgot to watch at my stopwatch, so I will stop now because we are, I spoke for eight minutes. Sorry for that. Oh, well, you're, you're fine, Victor. Um, so we did have a question from Seth. Seth, would you like to vocalize your question? Yeah, um, so, so Victor, um, what does it really mean for a product manager to be involved in uh, product delivery uh, if you're not actively writing code? Um, yeah, very good so. question. Yeah, actually, I am the one who, who writes up the problem statement, who works together with the engineers because refining the, the solution and seeing whether the proposal actually fits the problem statement is already a question. So even before any code gets written, you have to make sure that what you expect to get out of that issue is what you want it to get out. And once the solution is shipped, you again typically want to see whether that's really something that you want to have. Uh, this works better for front-end related works because then you can easily check that, yeah, this is the old screenshot, this is the new screenshot. Is this what you expected? But even for uh, more complex scenarios, you typically try to test before something gets released that that was expected. and you didn't get something totally wrong. So it's kind of like uh, trying to understand the, the requirement um, deeply. Yeah, yeah. Um, actually, so that you I, can... I would, yeah, in delivery, I would say that my job is to unblock the team so that they shouldn't have any questions uh, towards me. And this is, especially in remote setup, super important to be done beforehand. And if I fail that, then I should just accept that I will have to move very, very fast during uh, the delivery and, and provide them answers. Awesome. Thank you very much. Great question, Seth. Uh, we have another uh, question. Um, Owen, Owen, Joe? Oh? Would you like to ask a question about um, keeping the design architecture clean? Um, if not, I can vocalize it for you. Um, oh, ask, I'm curious, how do you keep the design architecture of such a huge system clean? Um, and I'm not sure if the if this is correct, but free from errors. So I think maybe he's talking about organizing all of the boards and issues um, into a system that moves forward. Yeah, in terms of boards and issues, like organizing, it's really just the, the best way that I found is to to to, to has two ingredients. One is that I know very well what I want the team to work on. Actually, there's, there's one thing I didn't sh share with you, but at every iteration, there is an issue that we create where in human terms, I write out what the goal is for, for the coming iteration. So there might be some links to issues, but it's really the, the, the user goal that I, that I try to formulate that we want to improve a registration for, for example. And providing this higher level description of, of the goal already allows engineers to understand what they are working towards. This is one, and this helps me as well to keep, keep organized my head, the priorities. And after that, the second ingredient is that I review pretty regularly the board to make sure that the priorities fit uh, my goals and, and what I want to prioritize first. Otherwise, from a design perspective, like, like uh, how you clean, how you make it clean in such a huge system like GitLab itself, we have something called the pajamas design system, which provides a huge amount of widgets and components and everything that our designers can just work out from. And that's how we uh, make it uh, a nice experience for the user. Thank you, Victor. 
Um, any more questions for Victor? And, and Victor will stick along, uh, around hopefully for a little bit so we can, um, he can chime in if there's any other questions. But uh, anyone else for Victor? Otherwise, I think we'll move on. Um, let's see. Do we still have? Let me make sure. Uh, did we lose? Did we lose our? Um, oh, sorry, I'm having a technical. Um, do we lose Andrew? Andrew, are you still here? Uh, while we're waiting for Andrew to, to come back online, we will. Um, Fatima, do you want to go next? Uh, sure. I'm not nearly as prepared as Victor with a slide deck, um, but I can share my screen and we can look at the handbook together. Um, so I'm on the developer evangelism team and the way that we like to talk about uh, how we work is kind of listed out in the handbook. Uh, we call them the three C's. So content creation, these are things like giving talks, participating in community discussions and panels, um, community engagement. So we're on a couple of different uh, platforms. We have GitLab issues. We have a forum where our customers talk to us directly. But then we also have Hacker News, Twitter, Stack Overflow. So you can see uh, on the top of my browser, I have this like group of tabs called Pulse. And that's really where I keep like uh, Hacker News, the forum, and uh, Stack Overflow open. And so in the morning, I'll open all of my Pulse tabs and just look at what's incoming and what's new. Uh, for the day and kind of go through some of the things that might be in, like important to look at right away. Um, and then the third C is consulting. So like I said earlier, we represent the voice of the community. So it's our job to kind of bring in, you know, trends that people in the community are talking about. So an example of that is like if I'm seeing a lot of discussions on a specific topic or there's something that people really want us to write about or hear about, that's, that's something I'll see over time. And I'll come back and say, hey, maybe we should write a blog about this. Uh, because there's a lot of interest in the community and it's a gap that we're seeing. Um, so everything we do is, is documented. I know you're hearing a lot about this handbook, but as someone who joined the team recently, it's been so great. Uh, whenever I have a question like, hey team, how do we do uh, conference submissions? Uh, my manager will be like, here's a link to the handbook where the process is. Um, and you can also like update that process as you go. So if there's questions you have, or if you think that maybe this process isn't working, uh, there's this openness to, to go ahead and edit that or uh, create a merge request and provide, you know, feedback to changing the process or updating it. Um, so yeah, so that's where all of our work is. And then we, uh, like Victor, manage our issues on the developer evangelism label. Uh, this is kind of the overview of what our board looks like there's a lot of like conference submissions uh we have this issue here where we're talking about possibly starting a discord uh most of our issues are public so you could jump in <laughs> if you had feedback for us on a specific thing which i think is really cool you know as i work with people who aren't necessarily at gitlab it's kind of cool to share with them what i'm doing at gitlab because those issues are open to the public um i'm seeing like chat notifications. Thank you, Christina, for sharing the handbook link. Um, and then I thought following Christina's uh, screenshot, I would share with you the week of my mock interviews. Um, so this is the week of February 13th. Uh, it looks kind of crazy because I am usually on Pacific time. So those interviews were five in the morning for me, but they were like such a good experience that I was just like full of excitement for the rest of the day. Uh, as you can see, I don't have a lot of meetings. There's a couple of check-ins throughout the week uh, with my teammates, like my manager and I check in every Wednesday. We have like this one-on-one -on -one doc. So, you know, every day when I think of something I want to talk to him about, I'll just like drop it in the doc. And then on Wednesday, we'll go through the different things that I've put in there. Uh, another thing that you'll see on my calendar is a lot of focus time. So we have um a goal for the quarter for my team to put out a number of blog posts and so i blocked off my calendar to make sure that i would have the time to write that blog post because otherwise i'll get busy you know answering things on the forums or something similar so i have that and then i mentioned uh community pulse so i try to set time for myself usually in the mornings if i can <laughs> to make sure that i set aside time to take a look at the forum take a look at hacker news look at you know, what, what are people talking about today? What's trending? Um, and like, where can I engage to have impact? Um, and then one last thing I'll share with you that I think is really fun. And I got this from my manager, Dodd, is having like a daily prep and a daily wrap up time. And so 
it's really great because I'll come to my desk and I'll try not to have meetings, but as you can see, sometimes they're super early meetings, <laughs> so I can't necessarily prep in the morning, but it's a great time to, you know, review what's in the queue. Maybe there's issues yesterday that I didn't get a chance to answer or I ran out of time. So, you know, kind of analyze like, what is the really big thing I need to do today? What are some small things I need to tackle? And then, you know, go on with my day. And then at the end of the day, just to make sure I don't walk back into my office and keep working <laughs> after I'm done working, I like to be like, okay, here are my priorities for tomorrow. Here's the thing I need to do first thing in the morning. And then be like, close my laptop and walk away, which can be really hard when you're working from home to really have that like start and end. Uh, so having like those meeting slots helps remind me to, you know, be good about ending my day and starting my day uh, with some structure. Um, that's all I have to share. So I'll stop sharing uh, and then check to see the chat if there are any questions. Yeah, thank you for sharing the DE board. <laughs> yeah, questions for Fatima. question for you while, while yeah. <laughs> so um, one of the things that I talk about in the in the mock interviews uh, was um, the importance of knowing where to to get help so a lot of uh, since a lot of these students are going through the process of preparing at it to enter the interview uh, or the job market here soon after they're um, they're done with we think code uh, I, I know you mentioned stack exchange and that or um, uh, Stack Overflow, and that was one of the things that I really mentioned uh, in, that, that was important, is that when you're asked a question about where do you go for help, right, uh, a lot of, of students in the program answered, well, I, I, you know, I, I look at the documentation or I ask my colleagues, but uh, one of the most important things is to be able to say that you can go to the, the community forum of the of the community that that of the product or the tool or the project. So if you wouldn't mind, I'll give you a second. Do you want to pull up um, our forum and show uh, just show them a screenshot and I'll give you a second here. Um, so uh, to, to pull that up because I think it's yeah. really important. Yeah, and Stack Overflow is another really good example. So yeah, if you want to talk yeah, about so that real quick, that'd be great. I think that's a really great question to work on in advance of an interview to be like, well, you know, depending on what I'm working on, I might look at Stack Overflow. Uh, maybe you'll read like blog posts on dev.to or like maybe you'll look at implementations on Glitch. It's kind of like finding which of these online tech communities has, you know, the, the vibe and the culture that you like and then kind of staying there and engaging there and knowing where to get answers. Um, but I love that you mentioned like also figuring out where this particular company that you're speaking to does their work so whether that's like a slack that they run uh for their customers or whether that's them on twitter maybe they engage there and so we have a forum as you can see uh there are several different categories here um we do find that sometimes people just throw their question anywhere uh which is fine too we'll move it around for you um and so uh there's different categories i like to the first thing in the morning just come to the new category and take a look at you know what's come in between yesterday and today. As you can see, we have some really great community members like Ian Walker, uh, who will just jump in before I even wake up and start helping community members figure things out. So that's always really great when you have like an active community uh, that's helping respond to things. Um, but yeah, if you were interested in GitLab and you were interviewing, it would be great to kind of walk through maybe the how to use GitLab section to see like what are the types of challenges people are having um, or the community section. Uh, we're trying to run a little bit more of an engagement kind of thing. So yesterday I actually did post like our March community update and I was like, here's our upcoming events. And so that would be, you know, if a company is doing that, then that's a great way for you to plug in and, and see where they are and, and maybe attend something that they're running that that's public. Um. Awesome. Thank you. That was a super great overview. We do have a question for you in the chat from Monique. Um, what, have, what have been your biggest challenges of being a technical evangelist? Oh, that's a hard question. <laughs> um, I think one of the things that a lot of technical advantages, uh, technical evangelists worry about is remaining technical. And, you know, because you're doing content creation and consulting and 
you know, advocating for the community, a lot of times you don't get to go really deep into technical implementation. So I don't do the kind of like long term software projects that I may have done four or five years ago. And so um, there's always a challenge to like stay up to date. And so, you know, you have to make time to learn a new language or uh, as PJ like builds Twitter bots and like learns Python out in the open. I think that's a the great way to keep up to date on skills and things like that. And so I haven't quite figured that out while at GitLab yet. It's only been three months, um, but I am in the process of trying to figure out like, what is it that I want to learn this year? Because I want to be consistent, continuously learning, but also, you know, delivering content and engaging. So keeping that balance can be really tough. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was a great, super great answer. Um, I think what we'll do is we'll have Andrew go next. Andrew, if you're ready, and then we'll open it back up to questions for everyone. So, um, Andrew, would you like to share a little bit about uh, what life is like as, a, as an engineer at GitLab? Distinguished right. engineer. So, uh, let me, I, oh. I can do that. Um, can you hear me? Oh, we have a little bit of a mic issue. It sounds really distorted for some reason. Oh, uh, yeah. Give me one sec. Can you hear me now? Is that better? No. Oh dear. I'm going to have to switch to my laptop mic then. I don't know what's happened. It might have been that power failure that I just had. Um, it's going to turn off. Is that any better? No, that's better. That's perfect. Okay. No yeah, longer I don't sound know, like don't a, a been... really far away robot. So. <laughs> oh dear. Oh dear. Um, so yeah, it was probably my uh, my power failure did something to my to my mic, which is a bit sad. But uh, what can you do? Um, my name is Andrew Newdigate. I'm a distinguished engineer in uh, in the infrastructure um, department at GitLab, which is part of the engineering uh, organization. Um, I joined GitLab in 2017. Um, I came to GitLab through an acquisition, so I was a co-founder of a startup, and Git uh, and GitLab acquired that startup and. Um, I was very lucky because the day I joined was the start of our um, Cancun get together. So my first day at a company was getting on an airplane and flying to Mexico, which was a really, really lucky way to start at a new company. I think there were about 100 people back then. Um, and I've been in infrastructure the whole time. I've done management roles. Um, I was a infrastructure director for a little while. Um, and now I'm what's called an individual contributor. So uh, my role is quite different. Um, an IC is somebody who doesn't actually have uh, anyone reporting into them. Um, and that sort of frees me up to sort of think about things a little bit more. So uh, what Christina was saying about being a manager of one, I'm still a manager of one, but I'm no longer a manager of other people. Um, and what I try to do is, is sort of think about things from an engineering point of view strategically um, and talk to as many different people as I can and get their input and try to align engineering teams. Um, uh, a word that people often use, not so much at GitLab, but in other companies is, is software architecture. So what people might refer to as that in other companies, I do a lot of that as well. Um, I think like a lot of people, my day, like, like, like Victor was saying, my day starts quite late uh, because a lot of my meetings are from about 12 o'clock onwards. So uh, luckily for me, I can get some time in the morning to go and do some exercise, uh, which suits me perfectly because I can get up the mountain and go for a run or walk or take my dogs for a walk while it's still cool um, and then get down and settle down and then start working a little bit later than I would if I was, if I was working for a local company. Um, and I think, yeah, I'll start off with my, with my, um, with my calendar to kind of give you an idea. So, Sort of, you can see most days my meetings only start at about lunchtime or, or you know, 11.30 or somewhere around there. The one exception is on a Thursday, I have a call that, that I do extra early and that Craig in New Zealand does extra late. And that kind of just shows the, the, the one of the things with, with, with working uh, remotely with people all around the world is sometimes it can be really hard to find a time that works for everyone. And so we have this call, you know, it's, it's in his evening after he normally finishes working and it's before I normally finish working and, and but we value the face time and we have a lot of things that we need to talk about. So we, we have that call every Thursday morning. Uh, but most other days I can, I can get some exercise done. 
Um, I would guess that about half of my, because of my, uh, my role and I need to talk to a lot of people, it's probably, it feels like about half of my work week is, is in meetings. Um, and I think that sort of increases with seniority in engineering. So the sort of more senior you get, the more meetings. But hopefully, uh, if I ever get a promotion, there won't be any more. <laughs> um, and, but I do get a lot of time to, to work. Uh, I, so the way that, like a lot of the things that I do, uh, I think Victor said that one of his jobs was to unblock people. And I think that kind of fits pretty well with my role as well. But whereas where Victor might be talking about like, where do we, how do we want to build this so that, um, you know, we, we're building a strategic, we, we're building a product in a certain way. I'm unblocking people on technical issues. So it's like, how do we build this so that it will scale, so that we can monitor it, so that it doesn't fall over in production, uh, and so we can make it more resilient. And, uh, and so it's kind of like trying to unblock lots of teams. I work with about four teams uh, in, in, uh, most of the time, but then I also kind of work with teams in other engineering departments quite a lot as well. Um, and so often I'll start my day by kind of looking through issues and, uh, and looking at all the responses that have come in overnight because I get a lot of stuff uh, that arrives while I'm asleep and I'll take a look at it in the morning. I try not to do it before I've done any exercise, otherwise I might just get stuck in for the day. Um, and, I, and I try to answer as many issues as possible. Um, and I think one of the things that Fatima said was that uh, she, she tries to keep sort of in the technology. And I think it's really important that I do the same thing because uh, I'm, I'm sort of in a role where I have to answer a lot of questions, but I don't want to kind of get disconnected from the technology. So I try to make sure that I'm still doing a lot of work. So I, I will open up a lot of uh, issues and, uh, and then work on, on MRs. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the work that I'm working on at the moment is actually confidential. So uh, there's, there's two reasons why I'm not going to show you my to-dos. And one is that, and the other one is, uh, shamefully, unlike Victor, I've got way more than 99 unread to-dos. Um, that's just where it stops counting. But, um, but that's definitely not the reason. It's actually that a lot of the work that I'm working on is, uh, is, is not publicly available at present, so I can't really share it. But I just thought I would share sort of one of the projects that I'm working on at the moment that is public. And that is a lot of the stuff that I focus on is monitoring and observability. And what that is, is, is when you are in a, when you're running like a really big system, you know, we have thousands of servers running GitLab.com and, and things can go wrong and it's very difficult to know when things are going wrong and stop it. And so you have to have strategies in place and sort of ways to do that. And that's one of the things that I really love thinking about. It's called observability or monitoring or metrics. Um, and it's, it's really about like understanding how the system is reacting and then kind of getting those insights before, before things break. And so if you think about it uh, in a sort of physical sense, you could imagine uh, somebody working for a, a company with a huge factory. And in this factory, there's this massive machine with like thousands of different parts that are all moving. And in order for the factory to be productive, everything needs to work all the time. And there's a sort of a, a crew that are on site making sure that, that nothing breaks down, that you maintain the machine properly, and everything that needs oil gets oil. And, we, and one of the things that I'm doing with observability is trying to kind of do that in a, in a virtual sense, right? And so you're making sure that all the things that need to run correctly are running correctly. And if they're not, you kind of give it some virtual oil or maybe make the machine bigger or scale up to, to horizontal fleets or whatever strategy you use uh, to kind of keep that machine going. And when you miss, that's often when we have outages on GitLab.com. So you know, something isn't being monitored properly and we don't get that signal and then it breaks and then often what happens is a failure spreads and it kind of goes around. So a lot of what I tend to look at is, is uh, monitoring. And one of the things that we're doing is we're building up sort of a new monitoring stack for self-managed instances at the moment. And so, you know, often we'll start with an issue and then sometimes if that issue gets too big, we'll turn it into an epic and that's what this is. So this is uh, an epic to create monitoring for specific type of GitLab instance. And you might write down sort of a, a, what you're planning to do. And then you add a bunch of issues that, that you're gonna work on in this epic. And the epic will be complete when, when all the issues are closed. So, you know, we sort of sat down at the beginning, we thought of all the things we'd need and we wrote them down and created issues for each of them. And then uh, from that, we create a milestone. So this is the milestone that we're working on. I think we're slightly over on this. 
uh, March 11th. Well, we've got one more day, so I think we're going to make it. Uh, and a milestone is, is kind of a group of, of issues that have a, a deadline on them, if you want. And then you get these really cool charts called burn down charts. Uh, and you can see as you add issues to a chart and then uh, as you work through the issues, hopefully that will get to zero and then the milestone is complete. And so this, it doesn't really look like it here, but I'm pretty confident we'll make this for tomorrow. There's just a few more merge requests that are in review. And then, and then we'll have done this and you can see sort of in order to implement this, we've had like 38 different changes that we've need to, need, needed to make to the system in order to, to make this change. And so uh, one of the things that people tend to do sometimes is they go, oh, I need to make this change. And they create a merge request that's like 10,000 lines long and nobody wants to review it because it's, it's just horrible and, and like really, really big. And, and those are often uh, the merge requests where people just say, oh, I just approve because it, it kind of hurts their eyes just to even understand what's going on. Um, and so that's why we've got 38 different merge requests because we wanted to keep it small. We wanted to make each change incremental. Um, and so like if I take a look at, maybe I've got a merge request here that I can look at. So this is, this is sort of a merge request that I created six days ago and it's a change to a system. Uh, and so often a good place to start is you go look at the changes and th this is where you'll see all of the code changes. So uh, uh, this is a little bit shameful because I just said that I, I don't like big merge requests and this added 4,486 lines. Uh, so that's not a very good example of this. I will, um, in my defense, most of this code is generated and we, there's, a, there's a very specific reason why we check this generated code in and it works in this case. Uh, so pretty much all of this code here where, where most of that is, is, is generated code and so we don't need to really worry about it. Um, the actual change is, is fairly small. So, you know, we've added some code here. Importantly, we've got some tests uh, and some more code and some more tests. And then, as I said, in this case, we've got all this generated code, which is kind of like the, the monitoring rules for each of the services. So we've got about 40 services that monitor GitLab, or that we monitor on gitlab.com. And then for each of those, ah, crash my browser. For each of those services, we, we have a bunch of rules that say, you know, if you see this or if you see that, like let the, let the operator know so that they can go and take a look at it and declare an incident and gather the right people to, to fix the problem before it becomes a problem that affects everyone on gitlab.com. And so that's really what we're doing with all of these alerts. Um, and, and so once I've finished kind of creating this, this, this change, so I'm just going to scroll back up here. Uh, if I go look in here, you can see when I made this change, I sort of pushed 13 different changes. So, you know, I was iteratively going through it. I, I went and checked if my CI/CD pipelines were working correctly, and if they failed, then I'd kind of correct something. Um, and I iterated through it uh, by myself for a while, and then once I was happy with it, I assigned some reviewers, so these three of my colleagues, and I asked them, can you take a look at this change and, and give me some feedback? And so often what you can see there is there's 18 comments on this. And so what might happen is uh, Bob would come in and he'll say, you know, have some questions. And he basically challenges me on, on what I'm doing and is this the right way to do it? And I think it's a really important part of the software engineering process to get that challenge. Like, I really dislike it when you have a big merge request and people just say approved because that's not what I'm looking for. I'm actually looking for like feedback from people to make sure that firstly they understand it. I've written it in a way that they can understand. Um, and then also just to kind of get a different view of, of how to do things. And so we'll often kind of go backwards and forwards. And, you know, sometimes I'll say, you know, I think in this case, it's like, this makes sense, but we're not going to do this now because we want to keep this change small, but that's a great idea. We'll come back to it. Uh, and then in other cases, you know, I'll go, oh, that's a really good idea and I'll, I'll make a change. And, and, and then Craig came in. Uh, Craig, I mentioned earlier, he's in New Zealand. So I always get his changes overnight and then I'll take a look at those the next day. And, and so, sort of through this process over several days, often the review process will take as long as the engineering uh, itself, uh, what's well, part of the engineering, but as, as long as the development stage. Uh, and then hopefully at the end of it, we will have like a, something that's ready and then I will merge it. And then sort of our CI CD pipelines will do all sorts of magic and it'll deploy to gitlab.com, hopefully without any incidents. 
and we can kind of move on. Um, I don't know how long I've been talking for. Do I have more time or should I? Uh... You, yeah, you can take a few more minutes for sure. And we have a bunch of questions for you. Uh, so I would uh, okay. yeah, keep okay, going. Sure. I guess the last thing I kind of mention is, is, you know, a lot of the stuff that I'm doing is, is, is also sort of strategic and, and like the software architecture side of things. And so, you know, sometimes it'll be like, okay, we've got something in place and it works pretty well, but like, it's time to make it better. It's not working in this way or that way. Um, it's hurting us in this way or that way. You know, we, we've missed this or we, we, there's an opportunity for that. And then often what I'll be doing is I will basically put together a proposal and then I'll start shopping it around. So I might go to like a PM or I might go to, uh, first people I go to is other engineers in the infrastructure department. And then I'll go to the managers I'll go to um, the other departments and in infrastructure, and then I might sort of take it further and try to kind of get uh, these proposals over the line and, and turn them into a project that we can run on at a later stage. And, and sometimes it's something that happens like as a single project, and sometimes pieces of it are broken off and, and done as, in, in, the, in the case of this, this is what's happened. We've broken this off into lots of small projects, and, and kind of over time, this has become a reality, but not in one big go, just rather small strategic steps. Um, and then a lot of the other work that I do is, is what's called sponsorship. So there are, uh, I'm a distinguished engineer, and then there's also principal engineers, sort of one level down, and below that level, there's a staff engineer. And, and those people are often seeing problems that they're experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis. And they often have ideas about how to fix those problems, and so they need kind of some, some amplification of, of those ideas. And so I'll work with them and not take the, pro the idea away from them, but help them kind of shape that into an idea that we're going to uh, sort of build out as, a, as, as part of our strategy. Um, and uh, that's pretty much uh, a lot of what I do. I hope that's, um, yeah, I think I'll, I'll, I'll end there and listen. Thank you so much, Andrew. That was really, really cool. Um, and in fact, a lot of the questions that we have for you, I think you touched on, but um, I think it's worth revisiting. So um, oh, oh, we'll just call you O, Oagil. I'm sorry, I'm probably not saying that correctly. Uh, asked if you could take us through some the process of, of code reviews. Um, and I know you showed that on your screen, but if there's any kind of best practices you want to share with, um, with the students here, that would be great. Um, so, like, this is my, my sort of personal view. Um, I think the, the most important thing, I, 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 I'm always very strong on this, and that is that uh, there are really, really fantastic tools that you can use for any language or for pretty much anything you do, and they're called linters, right? And the first thing that you've got to do is make sure that your project has got good linters in, uh, on, on it and you use uh, code formatting tools that come up with a standard way of formatting your code. And the reason why that's so important is I, I think there's, there's no worse waste of time than, than backwards and forwards on, on a merge request about a, a formatting issue or about a style problem. And, and uh, you know, often it can kind of go, especially if your colleague is in New Zealand and, and you're 12 hours away, and you can kind of go backwards and forwards over several days. And so I'm like a really big believer that the more linting tools and the more standardized format that, that you can have, the better. Um, I use a language, I, I write a lot of code in a language called Go. And Go kind of introduced this uh, thing called GoFint, which stands for Go Format. And all Go code is formatted in one way. And that was just such an amazing invention. It was probably one of the greatest productivity boosts to software engineers in years. And basically, it stopped all arguments about the right way to format things. Where before, I used to have merge requests where people say, ah, the, the curly bracket goes on the next line. No, it doesn't. And you'd, have, you'd waste time. And it doesn't really matter. And, and with GoFint, uh, you kind of defer to, a, to an authority. And, and GoFint chooses. So you never comment on, on those things anymore. Um, another thing that I think is really important is that uh, people often say, you know, tests are really useful because they can help you to, to test your code, obviously. But there's another thing about tests, and that is that it helps the reviewer because they will see the changes in your tests, and that helps them to understand exactly what the code is doing. So it's kind of a way of saying, this is what I expect. It's kind of like a, an executable documentation, if you want, that says, this is what I'm expecting the code to do. And if you write, like, nice, clean tests, it often helps your reviewers um, in, in, the, in, in that review process. 
And then I think the, the third thing that I think is, is really important is that um, we mentioned like always assuming good intent. And sometimes like engineers are kind of famous for being really proud when it comes to their code. And it's like, this is the greatest code ever. And the, the point of the other person is to come along and say, well, did you think about it in this way or that way? And, uh, you know, it, it is possible that you might take a comment in the wrong way. And, uh, and so if you, if you assume good intent and, you know, and you kind of always focus on that, I think it really helps uh, with, the, with the review process. That was an awesome answer, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I love that. Uh, we have a question from John. What happens when you miss the deadline? Uh, and I did share the um, the link that deadline is a misused term in our handbook. But Andrew, um, what happens if you if you're you know like your milestone that's coming up today and tomorrow? Uh, what happens if you if you don't don't finish everything by the due date? So uh, honestly, nothing nothing will really happen. Uh, to be honest, that that that. that that deadline was actually set for a week ago and I changed it because I had some other work that became important. Um, I, my manager said, you need to do this. I said, well, in that case, I have to push this back. And there was no, there was no kind of, uh, kind of, the deadline is for myself. It's, it's kind of like an internal thing that I kind of gauge myself on. Um, and the, the other thing that I think is really important is that when you're building software, there's kind of three levers that you can pull. And the one lever is the quality of the software that you're building. One lever is the amount of time that it takes you to build it. And then the third lever is, is how much, how, the scope, right? So scope is like how wide and how big the thing you're gonna build is. And those are the only three levers you've got when you're building software, right? And um, what often, no one wants to kind of mess with quality. No one wants like pull, no one wants to admit to pull quality code. So that lever is like always at 100%. And that gives you two levers. The one is scope and the other is time. And uh, what happens, the way people used to develop software is they kind of used to just overrun and overrun and overrun and it's called scope. Well, you still get it a lot. It's called scope creep. And a project is never finished because there's just always more and more scope. And what you find is that the scope never finishes. Like literally you can think of more things to do until the cows come home. And um, so, so what is a much better way is to basically fix the time fix on quality, and then if you need to cut down on scope, right? So you reduce the amount of scope. You say, I'm not gonna make the deadline, let's kick some things out of this project. And when you look back, uh, you'll be amazed at how unimportant a lot of those things, which at the time you thought were really important, they're not actually very important and you could get by just fine without them. Thank you, Andrew. And Victor, um, I noticed that you mentioned in the chat something about a retro. Um, do you mind sharing a bit with the students about what a retro is? Sure. Um, so, as I'm at the other end of, of deadlines than Andrew is from time to time, uh, from my point of view, when, so first of all, I never tell, I never commit to any deadlines towards users. So that's rule number one for product managers, never commit. But I, as you have seen the planning board, there are deliverable items that I expect engineers to deliver and sometimes uh, we fail those. Sometimes this is totally fine in the sense that throughout the iteration, information comes in and one day into the sprint, we might expect it to be missed. So that's, that's fine. On the other hand, there are situations where it's really surprising and that's when I think we should learn about it. And that's, that's another pretty core idea that you can find throughout the industry that, that really what, how you should measure success is how much you learned often. It's not how much you delivered and especially not in number of features. So what we, what we do at GitLab is that we run retrospectives after every milestone where these are first at the team level. So the team goes through what was great, what was, not so great what could be improved, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, the, there are minor variants from team to team, but these are the core aspects. And there's a discussion again in an issue um, about the the previous week's work. And after that, the conclusions are lifted up to a stage level discussion. And then now there's a, a section level discussion as well. 
I think there are no more company level retrospectives uh, for one year or something like that because we grew too big for that. But that's that's basically the idea of retrospective that you want to learn in the team. Like so, next time you can you can plan better. You you know what to look out for from in, in advance actually. And then when you have some learning that might be worthwhile to share with others, then you bring those to the higher level retrospectives that have broader coverage. Thank you. That was that was really super useful. So um, I'm just going to share that there's a what Victor was saying is that we organize those retros by state by our stages by our product stages. Um, so <laughs> and the handbook really talks about how making uh, retrospectives a safe and welcoming environment to have a true discussion is really important. And I think that ties back to our culture um, that we mentioned before, um, and assuming, assuming positive intent and iteration and all of those uh, different different aspects. So let me scroll back up. Uh, we have a question for um, from Monique to Andrew. Do you miss? The startup environment, or do you prefer your current environment? Um, and what aspects do you uh, like of both? Um, I I think it's a little bit like a startup still, um, believe it or not. It's just a very big startup now. We're not a startup. Let's be clear about that. But um, I I think that there's plenty of opportunities to still work in that startup way. Um, for example, I'm working on a greenfields project at the moment. And it's really important, you know, what's great is that, that there's no kind of code that's been written that we need to maintain. We get a fresh start, uh, which is great. It feels a bit like a startup. And we have uh, some very ambitious deadlines that we're trying to chase. And I was just commenting to a colleague this morning that sometimes that feels like I'm in a startup within a, within a bigger company. So you still get that. Um, and of course, there are things that are, you know, that I miss about being in a really small startup. The, the startup that I founded, we only had 10 staff. So it was, it was really small. So even at the time when I, when I joined GitLab, we went to 100 staff. It felt like this massive kind of jump up in the number of people that I had to deal with. Um, but there's, there's a lot of advantages as well. Like there's a lot of support. Uh, and often it's small things. Like if you can't log into Gmail, I don't have to fix it. I can sort of get in touch with somebody and they will help me with that. And uh, a lot of that stuff is taken for granted and I, I'm, I'm really glad about that. Um, but yeah, there, there are things that I, that I miss about um, small startups, but there's a, lot of, there's a lot of great advantages too. Thank you, Andrew. We have another question uh, from, let's see, Pranav, uh, which is how do you deal with incidents, if any, that come up? And I'm going to start this one with Fatima, if that's all right with you, since you're on the developer um, evangelist team and you get to uh, participate in some of our um, our monitoring of, of events. So would you like to share the DE process and then maybe we can hand it over to Andrew or um, Victor to talk a little bit about the infrastructure setting? Uh, yeah, sure. We have a process called the community response process. So usually if we're brought in, then it's going to be an incident that is going to affect users. Maybe there's already like a thread in one of our many community channels gaining traction. So uh, when something mentions GitLab, we have a channel that, that pings us and lets us know. And when something mentions GitLab and starts getting a lot of traction, it shows up in more than one place so that, you know, just in case someone doesn't see it the first time, at least one DE team member can, can keep track of it and keep an eye. Um, Honestly, like I'm, I'm still very new and, and I've been told that this community response process leads to a lot of burnout because, you know, you're, you're this, the face of the company to these users who may be very frustrated or uh, upset or, you know, their work is being slowed down. And that's something that, you know, that, that can be a big struggle. And so they're really looking for resolution. They're looking for answers while, you know, we're still figuring things out. We might still be, you know, fixing the thing that isn't working. And so kind of being in the middle of that bridge between two people and just kind of keeping things uh, transparent and informing them and, and, you know, letting them know what the process is like. Um, I've experienced a couple of small ones uh, so far. It's been very interesting. <laughs> um, it's very important to, you know, like not take it personally, you know, when a community member comes to you with, with concerns and, and kind of stick to the facts, but also be empathetic and be like, I'm sorry, you're having this issue. Like, here's what you can do uh, in the meantime. Um, but yeah, the community response situation and process, uh, thank you for the handbook link. Christina just dropped the link 
uh, to the very specific process that we have uh, is definitely something that over the next few months I'm going to look at and see how we can improve because everything in the handbook is open for improvement. Um, so that's something I've been thinking about how we can make that process uh, a little more sustainable for all of my team members, especially, you know, when someone's on parental leave, uh, how can we balance the load of responding to the community? So something something I'm going to be thinking about. So ask me in a few months how that's going. <laughs> Or, or check out our DE issue board and you might you might see some discussions there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. So if you have, have any ideas, feel free to uh, visit the board and comment on the issues. We welcome input from the community. Um, Andrew, do you want to talk a little bit about what the incident response side looks like from the infra infrastructure side? Yeah, sure. So it, it sort of took me back a little bit. I, as I mentioned, I started in January 2017. Um, and in the 1st of February 2017, uh, GitLab had its, its biggest incident, possibly the most famous incident uh, of, of all time, uh, where we deleted our um, production database. Um, and that was, that, so that was kind of my introduction to, to GitLab incidents, which was uh, quite, a, quite a steep sort of learning curve. Um, and I think it's got better since then. So that's basically what I'll start with. But really, um, like my sort of point of view is very different from Fatima's because we are kind of not very connected to, to the users. We are very much looking at the infrastructure and trying to figure out what's happening. And the most important thing is that we have good monitoring and good metrics. And so we, we, we use Grafana, which is, a, which is an observability tool. And we will start taking a look at all the graphs that we've built. And hopefully we've built them in a way that we can sort of translate what's happening and understand what's going on. And we, we can debug this live, you know, like I described earlier, this massive machine that now all of a sudden there's cogs flying out the side and, you know, glass breaking. And we can go from that to saying, okay, this is wrong. And that's why it's really important to have all these dashboards and, and, and importantly, they've got to all be working and, and we can read it. Um, I th I'd say one of the things that is uh, very sort of important is that um, you get practice. And so if you go back to like 2018, we were having major S1 incidents on a weekly basis. And one of the strange things about that is that we actually got really good at dealing with these production incidents. And we could kind of, you, you get practice at them and you can very quickly get a feel for what's going wrong and solve them. And one of the problems with over time, you know, we've, we've made the system more and more reliable and it's, it's compared to how it was, it's, it's really fantastic nowadays, but we have far fewer of those incidents and, uh, oh dear, my headphones have gone. Let me just, uh, uh, they're back. I'll carry on talking. Um, and so they, so, um, you, you get out of practice a little bit, you sort of not as good and, and, and as fast. So somewhere right at the beginning of the call, um, somebody mentioned uh, chaos engineering. And so that's one of the things we have, we're starting to do what's called game days. And really what that is, is kind of practicing for incidents so that you can kind of get like incident fit um, and be able to respond in a way um, that, that you can kind of handle things. And because there's a huge amount of information that's, that's arriving at you. And often what happens is when one thing breaks, all of your alerts start um, firing. So, you know, one system breaks, you get alerts from that, and then suddenly everything, the, the, the incident spreads, and then you're getting alerts from everywhere. And it's kind of like trying to drink from a fire hose. And that being good at that takes practice. And that's why we do uh, game days. Um, and yeah, just really knowing all of the tools and having practice at that is, is really important. Um, and I think the, the last thing that I kind of want to mention is that when you do get these incidents, particularly when they're very high severity S1 incidents, and there's a huge amount of pressure, you kind of feel that the world is watching and like everyone's going, ah, I can't push my commits. It's my deadline today. And like, it's all your fault. Hopefully they don't say that. Sometimes they do. Um, then you, you feel a huge amount of pressure. And one of the things that, that you tend to do is, is under stress, this is a natural human instinct, is you kind of go into like a tunnel vision. And so you might sort of focus on, on something you say, oh, this doesn't look right. And then everyone in the team starts looking at, at that thing. And, and actually the problem is something else. And so one of the things that's always worth remembering is like try and, and look at all the signals and, you know, kind of try everything. Um, I think 
one last thing that I'll say is that one of the things that we've got much better at over time is we've built a lot more structure around roles. And so we have the EOC, which stands for engineer on call, and that's the person leading the incident response. And we have an IMOC, which is a manager, it stands for incident manager on call. Uh, we have a CMOC, which is a communications manager. And over time, we've built up these roles and we've, we've achieved a lot more maturity around uh, the structure of an incident. That was awesome. Thank you. I shared the um, incident management handbook, which walks you through our full procedure um, on how we manage incidences. And then it also shows, um, you know, who is the current EOC and how we file the incidences. So there's a lot of um, information there as well. We're um, almost out of time. Um, so let's see. Maybe we have time for one more question. Um, and I think it is a question about um, what is your practice process for code refactoring? Should I take that? I think. Yes, because I don't okay. know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so I, I think the, 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 the most important thing with code refactoring is that um, it, I often call it yak shaving, which is kind of like an engineering term for, for, for code refactoring. But the most important thing is that when you're doing code refactoring, you try to change as little as the system as possible. So kind of in the merge request, you don't start adding features or anything. The, the refactor is the refactor, and then the before and the after of the refactor should be about the same, like from a, from a user's point of view. And you don't tie refactors and like, fe like new features that you're adding to the product into the same change because that's a surefire way to kind of really start hurting yourself. Um, and, uh, and, and when you, when you just sort of look at the change and you break it into two parts, you say, well, in order to do this thing, in order to add this new feature, we're going to have to change this code. So you change that code, you get that in, and then you add the feature. And so you, you sort of try to be a little bit more strategic about things. That's the first thing. So keep your features and your refactors into different changes and keep them apart. And, I think some of those merge requests that I showed, you could see they were clearly re titled um, refactor. And, and what I want out of that is, is as few changes to the actual running system as possible. It's kind of maybe the way the code is designed is different, but the actual outcome is the same. Um, and then the, the second thing, which is really, really important is tests. So like what I want to do is I want to kind of go through the code and make lots and lots and lots of edits and then almost without thinking, I just run my tests. And if my tests pass, I should have complete confidence that, that the refact has been successful. If I run the test, and, um, but I'm not confident that we have enough test coverage, then I'm going to start being much more careful about how I refactor. And when I send the change request to other people, they're going to go, well, like, are you sure that this isn't going to break something else? If, if people have to say that, that means that your test coverage isn't good enough because it should be that, that people sort of look and they say, well, we've got a green, you know, the CICD pipelines are green. Well, it must be perfect. Um, and obviously that's a huge oversimplification. There are always sort of external factors, but generally that's kind of what you're tending to, to, towards, right? You want like the test to cover the important sort of failure cases. And if you can do that, that, that really uh, helps a lot. Um, and then the, the, the last thing I would say is, if you're lucky enough to use a language like Java, um, different people's idea of lucky, but um, you know, if you use Eclipse or IntelliJ, the, the refactoring tools are, are just phenomenal. Like they are so, so and C, C Sharp as well. They're just so amazing what you can do with the refactoring tools. I use Go, um, and as I said, and, uh, and, and some Ruby and a whole bunch of other languages. And the refactoring tools aren't as good. Um, but what you can do is if you get really good at regular, learn how to use regular, regular expressions really well. And it's amazing what you can do with like really complex regular expressions across the code base. Um, so that's a good um, sort of shortcut. Oh, I think, I don't know if there's yeah. anything further. Um, say from your side that you, that you want to add before we close yeah. out and give our thanks. I wonder if I could squeeze in one uh, extra question for Andrew. Um, so our second years are currently working on a uh, introduction to distributed systems. 
Um, and so previously they, they worked on the same code base, one, one process, one service, and now they've been split up into groups of four and they had to build their own services. Uh, just out of interest, your actual environment, how many services do you deal with um, under normal operation and load? Oh, sorry, sorry, I'm struggling with my Bluetooth. Um, I, I think I'm back now. Um, we, I think at the last count, we had several thousand servers for, for GitLab.com. Um, and uh, so it's quite a lot. If you want to, you can break us, and that's for the production instance. If, uh, what we're doing is we've been moving our service to something called Kubernetes, which is kind of um, like it's a network operating system. So if you think of Linux as a sort of standard way of running processes and servers on a single computer, Kubernetes is kind of like that for a network. So instead of saying, I want to run this on this computer, you say, I want to run this and it can run anywhere and it's distributed and it gives you all of these constructs to do that. And so Kubernetes kind of takes care of, of scaling up our fleets and scaling them down. And it's like, well, you know, I see that there's a lot of web services that, you know, are running really hot. Let's add some more of those pods. And so it'll add some of those. And they'll say, well, I need some more space to run that. And so we've kind of stopped tracking uh, how many servers we've got. And the cluster just kind of takes care of itself. We also have other servers which we call, so there's this thing called cattle and pets. And so pets are things that you name and cattle are things that you don't. And so the Kubernetes servers are, are, are cattle because they just kind of come and go and they just appear when we need them and then they disappear. And pets are things like our Postgres primary server. And I can name that for you. I'll probably give you its IP address um, because it's really important. And you know, so, so, so those servers are the ones we really care about. And then we have this kind of rest of the fleet that, that we don't care as much about. All right, thank you very much for that very well detailed answer. Um, I, think, uh, I think that's our time up uh, with the lovely GitLab folk. And um, I hope everyone got a lot out of this because the, the comments were flying and the, the questions were flying. Please, 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 uh, if you guys uh, missed out on everyone's Twitter handles, um, I think we can share them again um, on the channel. And yeah, uh, thank you so much to Christina and PJ for um, bringing everyone into the fold and uh, giving the session. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you to all the guests as well, um, Fatima, Andrew, um, see you around. Thanks. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Christina. And thank you for sharing all those additional resources. I think there's lots of reading uh, to be done. So we are looking forward to hosting uh, perhaps other members of the team, or we welcome anyone who is in this call to join us again in two weeks' time. Uh, we'll be ironing out the details of what that looks like, and we hope um, the students in this call will, will join us again. Thanks, everyone, for your time, and have a great day ahead and a great evening, a great evening to everyone. the South Africans. Nice to connect with you. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye. Bye.